Welcome to the Kanoi Church Podcast. We're glad that you're interested in connecting through this teaching time. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy this teaching from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, today's it. Today is the last week of James. Yeah, and I don't know if that's like celebration for some of you. You're like, I'm so over James, or if, uh, if you're going to be missing it when it goes here, but today is the end. Uh, if you guys have Bibles with you, I want to encourage you to open up to James chapter 5. If you have a Bible app, open that up. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles on the chairs. And if you don't own a Bible, we want to encourage you to take one of our Bibles with us, um, with, with you, not with us. That didn't make any sense. Take one of our Bibles with you as you go, because we want you to have a Bible. Um, and they're, they're the brown ones. If it's not brown, it means it's somebody's. Don't take that Bible. Take a brown Bible. All right, we have um, 13 verses to finish out James chapter 5 this morning. So we're going to be James 5, starting at verse 7. And we'll just read the passage together, and then we'll jump in. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven nor by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Sincerely, James. All right, it's a lot. It feels like it's a big chunk this morning, all right? It's actually not any bigger than the other chunks we've been taking, but it is a big chunk. So we're gonna take it one bite at a time, and so we're gonna start with verses seven, eight, and nine, okay? So if you're following along, that's where I'm at. James gives instructions to his listeners here, but before we can really understand them, there's one thing to point out. This passage starts and says, be patient then. And I want you to know the word then is actually the word therefore, so help me out. What does therefore tell us to do? What's the rule? You look backwards, right. You look at the passage before. So if everything he's about to say, if there's a therefore, everything he's about to say is built upon what he just said. So what did we talk about last week? Last week he warned us to stop acting like our own little gods, pretending that God isn't playing a huge role in our plans. And he warned us to not be hoarding our wealth rather than caring for others and gaining wealth by means of injustice and oppression, all right? So we keep those two things in mind. Therefore, be patient until the Lord's coming. And he says that twice. Strengthen your heart, or the NIV says, stand firm, and do not grumble against one another. I'm just gonna take them one at a time. Be patient. The the Greek word for patient implies long-suffering, And that doesn't sound good, does it? Long-suffering, that's patience. 
Since James just addressed, addressed a whole bunch of rich folk who took advantage of their workers, it sort of leads us to believe that he's now addressing the workers who've been taken advantage of. He's saying, be patient. Be patient. You're suffering and the injustice and the oppression. While it's bad, be patient. And why? Because last week James says, because you're like a mist that appears for a little while and then is gone. The Lord's going to set things right. Your pain is temporary. The injustice is temporary. The Lord's justice will prevail. So be patient. And he tells us twice in seven and in eight, be patient. He says, strengthen your hearts. Or again, as the NIV puts it, stand firm. This has to do with a person's faith. Have the kind of faith that stands without wavering, that continues to practice the things that you know are good. Don't get tired. Keep your eyes fixed on heaven. For when wickedness prospers, it makes us all waver. Don't think that you're alone in that. When you look around at the world and you see wickedness prospering, you aren't alone if you think, what is going on? How is this fair? Why do I have to keep looking at this? In Psalm 73, King David actually says it feels like somebody takes his feet from him when he sees the wicked prevail. So like somebody has yanked the carpet out from under him and he's falling down. Even King David, a man after God's own heart, wondered how in the world can we allow the wicked, how can God allow the wicked to prevail? But James's words here remind me of Isaiah chapter 40, one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. It says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired and weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. <coughs> Apologize. That's going to get me. I'll try. You hate those tickles in your throat. Oh, hold on a second. Where was I? Sorry. Isaiah chapter 40. Even youths grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not be faint. So I don't know where you come from this morning. I don't know if that right there is enough message for you. Those are sticky, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> I see, it's a trick. I'm not going to be able to talk. That's what he was trying to do. <coughs> All right. <laughs> well, that's a new one for me. All right. I don't know if that's what brings you here this morning or if that's what you're bringing with you this morning. If you've been looking around and you've been struggling because you feel like all you see are people who are going about things the wrong way, succeeding. I don't know if what's happening in your life feels unfair. I don't know if it's some of the pain or the tragedy or the suffering you're going through. And you're wondering, God, all I've done is give you everything. Why do I have to go through this? Perhaps what you need to hear this morning is that you're not alone. Even King David wondered, why do those who are wicked prosper? Even he felt like it was a shot to the heart. And perhaps James's words are for you this morning. Stand firm. Be patient. Stand firm. Be patient. Because the wickedness, wickedness of the world does not get the final word. I'm sure you've heard that before. 
you've been around church long enough, I'm sure you've heard that before. But guys, sometimes we don't believe it. Sometimes it becomes like song lyrics that we know too well. They just become things that we say and they've lost their meaning. The wickedness of the world does not get the final word. God's justice will reign. There is a time when the mountains are laid low, the valleys are raised up, a time when every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. It is not the wickedness of the world that gets its final word. It is God who gets the final word. So stand firm, be patient, strengthen your hearts, be patient. This is what James is telling us this morning. In the very opening part of this passage, he's reminding those who gather from afar, who gather in faraway places, those who gather in the city, stand firm as tough as things look, as hard as they are. Despite what you're going through, be patient and stand firm because God gets the final word. Always. And then James adds this other instruction. And honestly, I think we always read it wrong. It's, it's this, it, don't grumble against one another. And if I'm honest, that's a really terrible translation. It isn't grumble against one another. It's not like I'm grumbling against you. It's actually don't grumble that make others uneasy. Think about this. When you grumble you have an impact on the people's faith around you. We might say it like this. Don't grumble about how bad you have it. Don't grumble about how bad you think it's going to be or going to get. Don't grumble about the revenge you're gonna get on those who've made it bad for you. Don't grumble about your jealousy of those who seem like they have an easy life without your particular brand of suffering. Why? Because that sort of grumbling does not build up the body of Christ. It does not turn anyone's eyes heavenwards, and it doesn't turn your eyes heavenwards. That sort of grumbling actually tears down the body of Christ, and it removes unity. James writes this letter in context to a whole bunch of people who had been circumcised. And those people had actually secluded themselves and separated themselves from people who were not circumcised. And they... They said terrible things about them, that they couldn't follow God, that they can't be with God. They were united in circumcision or uncircumcision. And James is saying to them, he's saying to us, whatever that thing is that you've allowed to divide you, that that particular brand of suffering, he says that is not what unites you. You are united by something greater than that. So you need to talk to somebody about the things that are going on in your life. Go, talk to somebody. Find somebody that you can trust. Find somebody who will listen to you. But my friends, if that talk is only ever grumbling, then what are you doing? If that talk is only ever grumbling, you're not building that person up. You're not building up the body of Christ. Be unified in your new creation, not what afflicts your old. Now, James is going to go on here, verse 10. That's where I'm at. He says, you you want to have an example of what patience and long-suffering looks like? He says, consider the prophets. The prophets of their past, the Jews' past, the people that he's writing letters to, people like Elijah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Jonah, Habakkuk. A huge calling was placed on their lives. They were esteemed by God. They were lifted up from obscurity to do a job, and yet they still suffered. And you think, oh, being a prophet, that must have been a great job. Friends, being a prophet is a terrible job. Nobody wants to be a prophet. Show me the prophet whose life looks great, and I will show you a false prophet. Prophets are hated by the people in their time, not revered by the people in their time. The prophet Hosea was given one of the most difficult jobs I can imagine. The prophet Hosea was called to marry somebody who would never be faithful to him. That that woman was going to cheat on him again and again and again and again. And what did God tell him to do? Forgive her every single time. And why? Why marry that person that's going to do that? Because their marriage was to be an example of what God was like for his people who continually cheated on God, but God still loved them anyway. What a hard calling to be given on your life. 
Or think about Jonah. We did a whole series on Jonah last year. Jonah was called to go to his enemies, the the most violent people of the day in Nineveh, the Assyrians. And he's called to go to a place where nobody goes and actually lives and preach a message of repentance. Are they going to like it? Are they going to hear it? Probably not. He's terrified out of his mind. But why should he go to the ends of the earth, to people who will never hear him, who who will never listen to him, to people who are so violent? Because no one is beyond God's reach. What a terribly difficult calling. James says specifically, think about Job. And if you don't know the story of Job, it's pretty easy to find. There's a whole book in the Bible devoted to the story of Job, but I'll give you the short version of it. Job was an incredibly faithful man to God, and God blessed him because he was faithful. He had a big family, land, cattle, wealth, everything you can imagine back in that day. But Satan was convinced that Job was only faithful to God because God had blessed him. God said no. Job is faithful because he loves me, not because of the stuff I've given him. And and, and so God gives Satan permission to take it all away. You can't kill Job, but you can take everything from him and watch what happens. So Satan does. He loses his family, his land, his cattle, his income, his wealth, his health, everything. And yet, Job remains faithful. And when Satan had been proven wrong, God blesses Job beyond what he had blessed him with before. And so this is what James means when he says, you've heard of Job's perseverance. You've seen what the Lord finally brought. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And I think James isn't just making an observation here. He's telling us what he thinks the whole point of the story of Job is. You see, you and I in our common vernacular, when we're going through times of suffering or when we get hit, boom, 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 boom again, we say things like, I feel like Job. I'm, I'm really feeling like Job. Or we even say it about other people when they go through all kinds of trials. Man, that, that person, that's, Job's going on there. Because we see the story of Job as a story of suffering. That's what we take away from it. But James sees something different. He says, I think the story that be, is being told about God in the, in the book of Job, in the, in the tale of Job, is it's a story that shows the compassion and mercy of God. It's one that gives us an example of someone who strengthens their heart, who keeps the faith, all while being long-suffering. That is the point of Job. So what if we changed our language? What if it wasn't in times of suffering that we said, I feel like Job? What if it was in times of incredible blessing, tenfold blessing from what we once had, times after we have been through the suffering, after we've been through the trial and the tribulation, that then we say, I feel like Job? James says, that's the point of the story. Live in this way. Live in this way. Live like Job. In the midst of your trials and your troubles and your suffering, live like Job. Keep the faith. Be patient. Strengthen your heart. Now, in verse 12, he says, he says something else. He says, above all, brothers and sisters, don't swear. Not by heaven or earth or anything else. All you need is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you'll be condemned. And I think the story of Job, when we think back about the prophets, when we understand that James is talking about things like being patient, that is what gives us context for this very verse right here. It's don't swear in your impatience. Don't swear as you go through trials and temptations. Our example is, is Job and the prophets, not the world around us. So as we go through trials and temptations and troubles, We may want to swear. We may want to curse. We might want to curse God. We might want to curse the land. We might want to curse the problems that are coming our way. But he says, above all, don't swear. Why? Because you swearing in your hardship isn't drawing anyone's eyes to heaven. And certainly not yours. You cursing doesn't make it any better. You might think, well, Nick, I thought if I just don't take the Lord's name in vain... If I steer clear of that, then I'm, then I'm okay. Well, not to James. James says, look, there's a higher calling than that. James would have made the assumption to the readers of this letter that they knew one of the 10 big ones is don't take the Lord's name in vain. He doesn't have to say it here. He assumes that you know it. 
But now he expands it to include the heavens and the earth, all of God's creation. Why would cursing God's creation, swearing at God's creation, swearing by God's creation, how would that make anything better? It, it doesn't draw our focus to God. It doesn't make your words mean anything more. He says, look, as you go through these trials and these tribulations, he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't swear. Don't feel like you have to swear. Your life practice, your words and your actions lining up, that is going to show what your word means. That's going to give your words depth, not swearing, not cursing. James says, as you go through trials and tribulation, your words and your actions lining up, that gives your word depth. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Now, James is going to bring his letter to a close. All right, we're coming down to the end. His time is short. He knows it. And we're going to kind of feel it here. He's going to squeeze as much in as he can before he says goodbye, which is, is why we're about to get peppered with what feels like a whole bunch of separate thoughts. And I think what we want to do, we often do, what pastors often do, is we want to take all those separate peppered thoughts and try to cohese them into a unified thought. And we're not doing that this morning because that's not what James is doing. He's closing the letter and there's a bunch of things he hasn't had a chance to say yet that he wants to get out and say. So what we should do is instead of trying to force them into a single idea, we should just realize that what comes next, what comes at the end, is no less important than everything else that came before it. Okay? That James's final thoughts are really important. So I'm going to read this next part because I want it to be fresh in our mind as we talk about it. This is a, a pretty well-known, pretty well-quoted part of James. It has to do with what we do when we're sick, all right? What should happen? He says, is anyone among you in trouble? Then let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, there are several directions that I could go with that passage to sort of explain this part of the letter from James, but I'm just going to make a couple of observations here. Here's the first one. If you're sick, pray. If you're happy, sing praise. Pretty obvious, right? That's what it says. I don't need to make it bigger than that. If you're sick, pray. If you're happy, sing praise. Give thanks. But you know what's interesting is what James is doing here is that he has put us on opposite ends of the spectrum. Sick, happy. Sick, well. And James has done that his entire letter, hasn't he? He's compared rich and poor, good wisdom and bad wisdom, proud and humble, faith and deeds, listening and doing, and now sick and happy or afflicted and well. So if we look at the big picture here, James is not just telling us what to do when we're sick and what to do when we're happy. He's saying that no matter where you are in the spectrum, this is sick, this is happy, and there's a whole bunch of life in between, right? No matter where you are on the spectrum, pray. No matter where you are on the spectrum, go to God, right? And that spectrum is not just sick and happy, it's rich and poor, it's listening and doing, it's faith and deeds, it's, it's every single thing, good wisdom and bad wisdom, Everything that James has done this whole time, he's compared these two different things. He's shown us so many spectrums where life happens in between. He's shown us the extremes and said, you live in here. Anytime you live in here, anytime you exist in there, go to God with it. Okay? That's what he's telling us right now. Because some only are in prayer when they're in need. And some only sing songs of praise when they're blessed. But friends... The call of scripture, the call of our forefathers, is a call that is much bigger than that, for we're told to pray without ceasing. That means in the good times and in the bad. We are told 
that we should sing songs of praise even when we're in chains, not just when we're blessed. No matter where you are in between these two places, go to God with it. And then James gives us instructions for when we're sick. And, and we should hear these instructions to us for when we are sick. So perhaps I've got a tickle in my throat today. Maybe you got a runny nose. Maybe you know somebody. Like, I got two kids at home who are sick right now, okay? Like, I know people who are sick. We should hear this as an actual instruction for when we are sick. If you're sick, call the elders of the church to pray over and anoint them with oil. It's the responsibility of the afflicted to reach out. And somewhere, we kind of bought into, church world, I'm saying, we bought into the idea that your deacons, your elders, your church board, your pastors are like all knowing. And when you don't show up for a week or two weeks, you're like, I wasn't here. Why didn't anybody reach out? Well, maybe we thought you were on vacation. We didn't know that you were sick. If you're sick and you want prayer, reach out. Right? So that's me. That's you. That's everybody. If we're sick, it's on us to reach out for prayer. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have elders and deacons and church board leaders and pastors that don't just check in and, and they don't have a job to do. They do. It says... If you're sick, you reach out for prayer. If you're one of those people in leadership, then it's your job to go and pray for them, to go and anoint them with oil. See, everybody has a job here. No one gets off the hook. For one of us to call ourselves a brother or sister, but to not reach out when we are sick or suffering or in pain or in the midst of loss is not really to be a brother and sister. It's not really, I mean, it shows that we don't really regard each other as brothers and sisters if we're unwilling to reach out. And for us to call ourselves deacon, elder, pastor, church board member, whatever it is, and to not go and pray for a person who has reached out, who has asked for prayer, is to prove that we are not in leadership of the church. Our life proves what we actually believe and what we value and how we understand this. We must pray for one another. And it's not a, a cold, rote prayer that's offered up. There must be faith in both the person who is praying and the person who's being prayed for. That's essential. Now, here's my warning with that. It is never, ever our job to accuse somebody of not having enough faith because the thing that we prayed for didn't happen, okay? I need you to understand that because I'm gonna say it again. The person praying and the person being prayed for must have faith. But you and I are, as James said, a mist that is here today and gone tomorrow. We cannot pretend to know the mind of God as we consider the life of even Jesus Christ himself who walked the earth, he healed this blind man. He healed this lame man. He healed this woman who was bleeding. And for all the ones that he healed, there were others that he did not. Why? Why did he not heal some? I remember what it was like having daughters that did not recover and being told by somebody in my Christian fellowship that the reason was is that we didn't pray the right way. Never should we ever Say that to somebody. I, and I'm not just saying that because I have a little high horse to sit on. I'm telling you, I feel blessed that it didn't divide me from God hearing that. But I can tell you, it divided me from that person. It divided me from that part of my community. Unity is essential for us to understand. And this is a way, a quick way, to just sever somebody's faith, to sever somebody right off the vine. We don't know the mind of God. What we do know is that we are called to be people of faith, that we are called to strengthen our hearts, to be patient, and to pray. And it is in that call that we go before God and we ask for the things like, I'm going to pray for this person to be healed. I, I am going to pray that. And I'm going to believe that it's so because God wants me to come to him with those things. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen. 
I don't know the mind of God. And I will say this too. I never would have been on the adoption journey with the kids that I have today if I hadn't lost the kids that I lost. That doesn't mean that that's the whole plan. My goodness, I will never know the whole plan. What I do know is that the loss that Chris and I experienced catalyzed us into a new direction, and God used those things in a whole way that I could never have understood and believed. I can't pretend to know the mind of God. Do you understand? I'm not gonna stand up here and pretend like I have all the answers, because I don't. I'm not gonna stand up here and pretend to tell you that it doesn't hurt every fall when we go through that time of saying, you know what, Sage would have been nine this year. It hurts. That loss happens every time. I don't have all the answers. But I do know that I wasn't wrong in praying that God would heal my daughters. And I do know that even though he didn't, God is still good. Okay? Let's keep going. James doesn't just tell us to pray for those who are sick and ask for prayer if we're sick. He also tells us to confess our sins to one another and pray for forgiveness. Pray for forgiveness from our transgressions. Pray for healing from our sin. And I think the thing that I just, I want you to know, I kind of went off on a riff there that I hadn't planned to do, but James thinks that prayer is really, really important. And if prayer is not a part of your Christian walk, then you need to start today. It's essential, okay? That's your communication with God. And it's also something that we do as a community together. We offer up prayers together to God. So it unites us as a community, but it is your conversation with God. How does it make any sense if you think of the person that you care about the most? I think Jeff and I talked about this this week. If you think about your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your son, your daughter, your mother, your father, whoever that relationship is, the person you care about the most, if you were to say, you know what, I think... I'm just not gonna talk to them ever again. I'm gonna do everything else. I'll still be there, I'll still help them out. My paycheck still goes into the bank account. I'm still gonna love them physically. I'm just never gonna say anything to them. What you've done is you've taken one really main method of, of sharing back and forth with that person and you've completely cut it off. So what you've done is that you have, if you can think of like a healthy plant, you just killed one part of it. One part of that is unhealthy. One part of your foundation is cracking. Your house is now going like this. You need a strong foundation, and prayer is a big part of that. Don't not pray. You need to pray. It's essential, and James is trying to tell us right here, in everything, pray. Wherever you are on the spectrum, pray. If you're sick, pray. If you're well, pray. If you've sinned, pray. Pray. And then he goes on in verse 17 and 18. He says, and this... I've waited for this. This is my favorite passage in like the entire book of James and I've had to wait until the last day of James to, to do this, okay? So here it is, 17 and 18. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced crops. You can see on the screen, if your eyes are good enough, I had to make it a little small to fit it all in. There's your Greek. There's a really direct translation. Elijah, a man, was of like nature to us. My favorite sentence in all of James's letter. What I want to do is I want to dig in and just, let's just see if it means what we think it means. First, you'll notice that in the Greek part, it says Elias. Elias is just the Greek form of Elijah, okay? So we're still talking about Elijah. And then you have this word, anthropos, and that word means human being. The word is used to distinguish, and this is key, distinguish human beings from plants, animals, God, Christ, and angels. In some ways, when you use this word, you're trying to say, this is not any other part of creation. This is mankind. This is human being. And part of the definition of this word is understanding that there is weakness, okay? The weakness is common to all of mankind, and it is the weakness that leads us to make mistakes and sin. All of that wrapped up in this word. This word is chosen very, very purposefully. What we're saying here is that Elijah is not superhuman. Elijah is just superhuman. He's very, very human. 
And then we have this other word. Um, and it's, it means suffering the like of another. It's like having the same feelings, having the same passions. Okay? And then the final word is hamin. And this word's really interesting. Again, very purposeful. This is a word that actually changes completely when it's singular and when it's plural. If James was saying Elijah was a man just like me, then the word would be ego. It looks like your waffle, ego, okay? If that word had showed up, it would be James saying Elijah is a man just like me. And we would read that and we would go, okay, is there a special trait that James and Elijah have that we don't have that we need to get? Because Elijah is kind of this like huge biblical figure, right? But he doesn't use ego because he's not talking about him. He's talking about us. So the word is Haman. And so he says Elijah is a man, is a human being, just like all of us. So if you're reading the letter, you're included in us. Not just us of 2,000 years ago. Not just us of the people who lived in Jerusalem. Not just us of the people who read the letter in biblical times. No, everybody who reads the letter is included in that us. So here's what it's saying. Elijah was not a God. He was not God. He was not an angel. He was not a plant. He was not an animal. Elijah was a human being who had human weakness for sin just like us. And you might say, all right, Nick, why is that important? Because it's all about prayer. It's all about prayer. See, James told us this morning that if you're sick, you should pray. If you are an elder in the church, you should pray over the sick. He told us to confess our sins and pray for healing from our sins. He said, before that, he said, look, be long-suffering like Job. Have faith like a prophet. Be patient like a farmer. And you might think to yourself, Nick, all that is kind of unrealistic. I can't do all that. That's such a high calling. It's too big. I can't do all of that. Am I really supposed to be that patient? Am I really supposed to have that kind of faith? Am I really supposed to confess my sins? Am I really supposed to pray for forgiveness and believe that it's going to happen? Am I really supposed to have the sort of faith that asks for prayer when I'm sick and go to my brothers and sisters about it? Am I really supposed to pray for others when they're sick? Really? Come on, Nick. It seems a bit unrealistic. I think that's the whole point. Honestly, I think that's the whole point. You kind of remember there's a story when Jesus is with a paraplegic, uh, a lame man, and there's a Pharisees there that are watching him. And he says to the Pharisees, he goes, which would be easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven or pick up your mat and walk. And of course, we know the easiest thing to say is your sins are forgiven because there's no physical proof of that, right? Jesus could say, ah, oh, your sins are forgiven, walk away. And everybody's like, well, I guess it happened. The harder thing is for Jesus to say, pick up your mat and walk. Why? Because there's physical proof that the person is either healed or not healed. Why do you think we often don't want to pray for healing for people? Because we're afraid that it won't happen. I think this is the whole point. Which is easier? To be patient or pray like Elijah that it doesn't rain for three years? Which is easier, to be strong in your faith or pray that it won't rain for three years? Which is easier, to confess your sins prayerfully to one another or pray that the rain starts again after three years? Which is easier, to pray for forgiveness and believe that it's coming or pray that the rain starts again after three years? In fact, I think it's fair to say it's even easier to pray for someone to get well than pray that the rain starts or the rain stops because... When the rain does or doesn't stop, there's the proof in the pudding. And we're often afraid of what the answer will be. You say, well, Nick, sure, I'll be patient. <laughs> I'll be strong in my faith and I'll ask for forgiveness and I'll confess my sins because Lord knows I am no Elijah. I am not praying for the rain. That's not working for me. I guarantee I don't have that kind of faith. I don't have that kind of prayer life. And that's the part where James would just pull his hair out. He's like, look, I have written this letter to you this whole time. You have walked with me through this whole thing. He'd say, no, you still don't get it. Pray the rain prayer too. 
Pray for the rain. Pray against the rain. Whatever it might be, pray the God-sized prayers because God hears the God-sized prayers. Pray the small prayers. God hears the small prayers. Pray for healing. Pray for God's will. Pray for forgiveness. Pray all those prayers because Elijah, who prayed some of the biggest prayers that we can possibly imagine in all of Scripture, he was a man just like you. God hasn't changed, and Elijah's a man just like you. So pray the same way that he prayed. Pray. Pray, pray. Are you with me? We need to be people who pray. And we must not be afraid to pray for the biggest things that there are. Amen. So what is the God-sized prayer that you have been trying not to pray? That you've been so scared of actually praying? Because what if it doesn't happen? What if it doesn't? There was a time in my life when the God-sized prayer was that a daughter would just get better. And then a few years later, it was exactly the same situation all over again, praying that my next daughter would just get better. And what happens if he doesn't answer me? What happens to my faith? What happens to my connection? What happens if I pray the God-sized prayer and it doesn't happen? Guys, that's the in-between has life, and it is hard, and it is hurtful, and it is painful, and you don't always get what you want, and the prayers don't always come the way you want them, but I'm not going to pretend to understand the mind of the Lord, for it is far beyond my own. If I could understand the mind of the Lord, he wouldn't be the Lord. I will have faith still. I will stand strong in my faith. I will be patient because the world doesn't get the last word. God gets the last word. And though I might be in pain right now, I am but a mist that is here today and gone tomorrow. The pain is only fleeting and God has the final word. I am telling you, my friends, we must be people that pray regardless of the outcome. If you don't ask, you won't have. We must ask. We must pray the God-sized prayer. Are you with me? Last two verses, and then we're done. 19 and 20. It says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. I'm gonna take a drink because my little candy just went away. <laughs> but it worked. That's what Ed said. I don't know if you heard it. He came up to me and he goes, this will work. Well, no more coffin. He was right. Here's what I want you to, to know. And this is the question I put on the screen because this is essential. Look, in the new year, we're going to do Advent. And again, I don't want to just blow by Advent. Advent is so important. I'm so excited for Advent. I'm so excited for Christmas. Christmas is just huge celebration. And we need to, we need to sit in that for the time that we have. But in the new year, we're going to be doing some like basics, like church basics, faith basics. This is one of those. All right, so I think, uh, yeah. If someone wonders from the truth, what are we being released to do? I want you to think about that for a second because, because what the right answer is and the one that I already hear people saying is often not the answer that our church, churches, give. This is one of those areas where our life and our actions do not line up. When someone wanders from the truth, what are we being released to do? Persecute and destroy them for wandering away? Because we often do. Judge them and slander them and gossip about them while they're gone? Because we often do. No. When someone wanders from the truth, you are released to bring them back to the truth to guide them in reconciliation and restoration. Not destroy them, not persecute them, not slander them, not gossip about them. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthian church. He said, we, uh, he said God was rec reconciling himself to the world through Christ, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. When somebody is already doing a job, and they invite you to do it with them. What is that called? When someone's already doing a job and they invite you to do it with them. 
How about partnership? Remember what we said last week? God doesn't do anything in this world without a willing human partner. When he wanted to set aside a whole family of people that would become a nation of people, he tapped on Abraham. When he wants to send his son, his only begotten son, to the earth to die on a cross for us, he taps on Mary and Joseph. When he wants to send the gospel beyond the Jews and into the Gentile world, he taps on Paul and Barnabas and John Mark and a whole bunch of other people. God doesn't do anything without a willing human partner. And right here we have, God is inviting you to be a partner with him. And it's not partnership in slander and gossip. It's not partnership in in destruction and persecution. It's not partnership in judgment. Those are his. We don't get that. He didn't invite us there. Where did he invite us? He said, I'm inviting you to guide people back to the truth. When someone leaves, you guide them back to the truth. And look, if we choose... If we choose to join God in partnership of guiding people back to the truth who have walked away from the truth, then we join God in the prevention of sin. We join God in the prevention of more disturbance of shalom if they had just stayed away from the truth, if they had carried on apart from the truth. We, we join God in all of the work that he's doing. God is inviting you to be a partner. And the thing is, So often, we let that go right by us. Guys, I mean, that's it. My notes just ended with the words, sincerely, James. Okay? That's the whole letter. A letter of God inviting you to be a partner with him in the work that he's doing in the world. Is a letter where James is saying, look, it's not just about what goes on up here and what goes on here. These things need to line up with these things. The work that we do, the life that we live, the words that come out of our mouths must line up with what we say goes on inside our heart. You have not been set aside. You have not been saved. You have not gathered in this place empty of promise and empty of reason. If you are here all for you, then... (laughs) Stay and know that ahead of you is something so much greater than just you. If you're here just for you and just your way and just your wants and just your desires, stay because something better is around the corner for you. It's a community. It's relationship. It's recognizing that God's way is above your way. It's better than your way. It's greater than your way. It's more powerful than your way. And guess what? He doesn't want to do it alone. We don't serve a God who sits up somewhere in heaven on a cloud somewhere completely uninvolved with the world that we live in, completely uninvolved with the creation that he created. We serve a God who wants to partner with you to bring about his will in this place. And I can't make that more clear. James can't make that more clear. Friends, we have just, in 11 weeks, walked through probably the most practical book of the Bible. If this letter hasn't given you ideas on your faith, like your rubber meeting the road, of how to live this thing out, of it not just being something that happens here, but it's something that happens here, that happens between us, that happens with the people that you're sitting with, guys, then we need to go back and do it again. (laughs) So here's what I'm I'm gonna encourage you to do. The last devotional is out there on the table. I want to encourage you to pick it up. If you haven't picked up any other devotionals, pick them all up. I put them all on the table for you. Read them again. Go back and read them again. If, if you have followed along with us every week, but you really haven't dug into the word, guess what? Take one of these Bibles and reread James. Let it catalyze you again. Okay? Now that you've walked through the series, watch as the Holy Spirit brings to your mind some of the things we talked about, and it opens up the word in a whole new way for you. But friends, we got to get this. It's essential. If we want to be a church that carries on into the future, if we want to be a church that is growing and thriving, that more young people come to, that more young families come to, that more children are coming to, that, that continues to go on beyond just this moment in time, then we need to be a people who actually live this thing out. Okay? It's that simple. And if we're not going to be a people that... that are going to live this thing out, 
then we might as well move over to the side and make room for another group of people to get in here and do that. Because that's what God's calling us to do. All right? It's simple, guys. I know it's hard. It's simple. I mean, Jesus says, look, my, my yoke and my burden are light. They're easy. And it's true. But the road that we have to walk while we carry them is full of potholes and sticks and rocks and all sorts of stuff. Okay? The road's hard. But we need to be there for each other. Because when I step in a pothole and twist my ankle, I'm going to need you to bandage it up for me. And when I have a really bad day, and I don't want to keep going, I just want to throw off the yoke, I need you to tell me it's worth it. Stay with me. Stay with us. That's what it means to be a church. That's what it means to be a community. It's not just about coming and getting yours. It's not just about coming and having your way. It's not just about coming and consuming the next good lesson or good song or whatever it is. It's actually being with each other. Being with each other in a way that just looks so weird to the world around us, but it's so good because it's God's way. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's pray. Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together.